Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, USC Institute of Urology's uh, Urology 60 Minutes. Uh, as uh, most of you are probably familiar by now, this is a weekly Thursday morning uh, rounds, grand rounds that we do, uh, where we truly have the best in the field of a particular topic uh, join us for, to uh, give us a lecture and we learn from their expertise. <clears throat> Our topic this morning is uh, GU prosthetics. And absolutely, um, we have the best in the field that are here today uh, to educate us. Um, it, Dr. Ken Angermeyer, my good friend and colleague at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, he's been there since 1993, is director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for GU Reconstruction. But Ken has also been president of the Society of Genito Urinary Reconstructive Surgery, has written extensively, and really, Ken is, um, doesn't need any introduction. He's absolutely one of the stars uh, in the field. Uh, Professor Alan Mori is a um, distinguished chair in urologic reconstruction and the Paul Peters chair in urology at UT Southwestern in Dallas. Uh, again, a preeminent thought leader and uh, one of the top uh, high volume uh, surgeons uh, in uh, prosthetic surgery. He too was president of the Society of GU Reconstructive Surgery and uh, directs their fellowship. So one of our um, uh, prerequisites for uh, being invited as faculty for this uh, 60 minutes is you have to have been a president of your society. So we already have two and Professor Jay Simhan who is next is on his way to being uh, uh, um, president of the GU Reconstructive Society. So he too qualifies. Jay is absolutely one of the rising stars in the field, no question about it. And is really uh, pushing the frontier. He's vice chair at Department of Urology uh, at the Einstein Healthcare Network and associate professor of urology at Temple and uh, Fox. Uh, so thank you all three of you uh, for uh, honoring us by being here this morning. And uh, the USC host is my good friend and colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Lodoyle. Uh, Jeffrey is uh, leading the charge at USC, doing an absolutely fantastic job. And uh, uh, he will be uh, talking about, uh, he, he'll be coordinating the entire enterprise. So Dr. Lodoyle, you're up. Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Gill, for your kind words. Um, good morning to everyone joining us this morning. Um, I hope everyone's staying healthy and kind of beginning to resume their clinical activities. So I wanted to give a sincere thank you to our visiting professors. They've set aside their time this morning, and it goes without saying that all of us are very much looking forward to hearing each of your personal experiences and insights on the nuances of prosthetic urology. Today I have the pleasure of hosting three truly world-class leaders in the field of reconstructive and prosthetic urology. Dr. Mori and Dr. Angermeyer will both be discussing their experiences with the artificial urinary sphincter, and Dr. Simhan will be sharing his thoughts on the evolution of penile implant surgery. If time allows, we'll also have a case-based discussion on a very typical but complex patient that we typically encounter in our practice. The first lecture will be by Dr. Mori. Dr. Mori really needs no introduction I first got to know Dr. Mori in 2016 when he joined us here for our inaugural practical urology conference. Since then, he served as a mentor and a true inspiration. Dr. Mori is synonymous with reconstructive urology and prosthetics, and his vast experience with the AUS really puts him at the cutting edge of really uh, maximizing patient outcomes as well as um, advising on how best to manage the most complex patients. We're really looking forward to hearing how you keep your patients dry and happy. Without further ado, Dr. Mori, it's all yours. Uh, yep, I'm good. Pull up my talk here for you. Um, so, good morning. Um, my comments this morning will center around uh, this simple uh, device, the artificial sphincter, some tips and tricks, and we'll focus mainly in three areas. Number one, patient selection, 
number two, the conduct of the operation, and number three, what to do when things go wrong. Now, let me just begin by saying these are my happiest patients, and it's amazing uh, the way that you can change somebody's life. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we lack as a, a profession in this diagnosis. And so in terms of the diagnosis, <clears throat> uh, I want to propose a very simple in-office uh, maneuver called the standing cough test and um, a little bit more about procedure selection. So let's look at that. <clears throat> As I mentioned, many of our patients have to wait a long time before they get this uh, <clears throat> very uh, influential and uh, remarkable procedure done. <clears throat> when we looked at 572 men who had their initial anti-incontinent surgery, most of whom were heavy leakers, what we found was that two thirds of these patients went on for more than two years and one third of them actually went on for more than five years. So it brings up a lot of questions as to why this would happen. I think part of it is yes, we want the nature of the disease to play itself out. Did they need any more uh, adjunctive treatments? Uh, maybe there's a knowledge gap uh, with the patients. Uh, maybe there's a lack of diagnosis. Maybe the post-prostatectomy patients uh, see a PA or somebody else who's not really facile, or maybe there's just no local expertise in this area. So um, a lot of questions, but uh, regardless, uh, you know, these people are suffering, and I think this is an undertreated condition. Uh, so <clears throat> One thing that we have proposed is this uh, standing cough test. And if you go to YouTube and you type in standing cough test, you'll see in there very clearly the grading scale that we have on it. And it's got almost 3 million hits now. Um, and this article from 2017, the Canadian Journal, uh, proposed this as a quick, rapid, uh, simple way of deciphering who should get a sling, who should get an artificial sphincter. And um, we boil it down to these five grades. Uh, grade zero is the patient who gives you a perfect history, has a wet pad, but when you do the standing cough test, you can't demonstrate any leakage. And let me just say that we have them cough four times uh, with, and we, we verify that they've been one hour since they last voided. So when they stand, there is usually somewhere between 50 and 100 cc's at a minimum uh, that will propel. Um, so one, let me just go back, um, the rest of the grading, grade one and two are the sling patients along with grade zero, and these patients tend to do very well with slings, and, and grade one and two are drops only. You can demonstrate the leakage, but it's only drops, whether it comes early or delayed. Remember, there's four different coughs, and sometimes it takes a while for the, uh, the small amount of urine to travel down the 26 centimeters of the urethra. Grade three and four is where it's more obvious. It can be drops initially and then becoming a stream or grade four where it's early and uh, persistent and really uh, a no brainer. So <clears throat> what we first found was that this correlates very strongly to the subjective pads per day that the patient tells us. Um, almost a perfect correlation actually. <clears throat> As we came to use this and investigate it and we correlated it with the gold standard 24 hour pad weights. What we also found was this simple in office test with the grading scale corresponded very closely to the quantitative uh, uh, amount of urinary leakage documented on the 24 hour pad weight, the gold standard. So we think there's a lot of validity to this as a simple way of uh, verifying what the patient's telling you. And what we found was that if you take a patient who is referred for a sling, many patients are referred specifically for a sling, um, but in fact, they are uh, worse than advertised. When you stand them up and cough and you watch the pattern of their leakage, uh, it's worse. And up to 72% uh, in this study show that uh, they really have uh, moderately severe uh, leakage and will probably do better with an AUS. So you have to explain to the patient that, you know, a sling is certainly an easy operation, has advantages, but it may not solve the problem. 
that the patient has. So we've been focusing uh, in the last year or two on the moderate incontinence patients. And that's where it's really important <clears throat> to look at these patients carefully. It's obvious when they're uh, grossly leaking or when they only leak a drop or two, but in the middle, that gray zone, we found that uh, it's typically a little worse than advertised. And as we've implemented this simple test <clears throat> into our practice, we've noticed a couple of very important trends. Number one is we're doing fewer slings and number two is when we do them, we're getting a better outcome. So you can see in red, the treatment success for sling rising while in blue, the proportion <clears throat> now somewhere around 10 or 15%, one out of eight of our incontinence patients do we ever perform a sling on. Most of them are gonna be better in my view, getting an AUS in this category. So one of our residents uh, put together a nomogram <clears throat> looking at three factors the subjective pads per day, whether they've been radiated, yes or no, and then a, uh, the grading scale by the standing cough test. If you factor those in, you can come up with a probability of sling failure. And that combination of those three factors performs better than any other parameters we could uh, put together in terms of area under the curve. And so what that means is that this simple nomogram can and should, I believe, should be used in the office. And if you want to write this down, if you type into your uh, Internet Explorer, tiny.cc.msigs, <clears throat> what it'll give you is this uh, little uh, uh, chart to put in the three variables, and it'll tell you exactly the probability that a sling will fail. So it's nice to show that to the patient using this simple nomogram uh, to tell them what their chances of success are. And as we get closer to 50%, <clears throat> then it becomes really not a worthwhile operation in my, in my viewpoint. <clears throat> and as I said, when you compare that moderate grouping, so these are patients with grade two to three, the moderate stress incontinence patients, <clears throat> and you look on the left column with a, a sling, 63%, versus an AUS 80%, uh, you see a significant advantage uh, to going with the AUS in this uh, marginal category. So next question, many of these patients have ED as well as severe incontinence, how to prioritize all this. And <clears throat> what we wondered was, if you have all these devices close to each other, would the AUS patients be more likely to sustain a cuff erosion? And we believe uh, that there are many theoretical reasons why they should. Number one, you have those cylinders in close approximation. Number two, that uh, cylinder uh, in the corpora space uh, may interfere with some of the collateral blood supply <coughs> to the uh, urethra as it uh, uh, has a bidirectional uh, blood flow. And number three, just the mechanical compression. Um, and also because they have ED, maybe they just have uh, worse vascularity in general. But, but we did demonstrate a three times higher cuff erosion risk in patients that had a penile implant. So using this information, we prioritize the waterworks first, we get the patients dry first, and then if they're really highly motivated, then we'll bring them back and uh, offer them an IPP, but we're less aggressive in doing so, <clears throat> trying to optimize uh, their, their continence aspect. So in terms of conduct of the operation, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a couple uh, tips here on how to do it, how not to do it. And I'll, I'll share with you our thoughts on this subject. Number one is when I came here to Dallas in 2007, um, we were doing some penoscrotal uh, uh, AUS procedures. And my thought was, well, can we measure the penis both in length and girth and predict the geometry of the urethra, both in the girth uh, circumference? <clears throat> and, and so we took 100 patients, both AUS patients and patients that were gonna have a, ure a perineal urethroplasty. So we had the same exposure around the urethra. We measured the penis, measured the girth, the length, and correlated it to the urethra in different segments. And what we found was a couple of very striking findings. Number one was that the distal urethra was always smaller than the proximal urethra, just like the arm, the leg, <clears throat> any other structure, it's, it's more robust proximally. 
And so if that is true, then uh, we believe that the cuff should always be placed as proximally as possible. The other interesting thing was the AUS patients had a much smaller urethra than did the urethroplasty patients. Now there was about a 20 year age difference, but <clears throat> what that told us was that probably the effects of the prostatectomy uh, were causing uh, some significant uh, atrophy to the urethra. And this probably predated the AUS. So we believe atrophy of the urethra occurs as a result of the aging and the operation more so uh, than the cuff uh, compression itself. <clears throat> and this uh, study was influential, Gerard Henry looking, comparing penis scrotal versus perineal cuffs. Penis scrotal cuffs had, were smaller cuffs all the way around. And uh, so if you look, as in this patient, that cuff is very distal. And we here we can palpate it high in the uh, perineum, almost in, uh, in the scrotum, far from the desired area. And these are a couple uh, cases where we had to redo the, uh, the penis scrotal location, putting it more proximally. Awesome. Tandem cuffs uh, were recommended and shown here in Gerard Henry's to be more commonly performed in the initial scrotal population versus the initial perineal population. So we've abandoned tandem cuffs. Actually, I just want to uh, mention that this is a very nice study from Hopkins looking in a cadaver stand uh, study with retrograde perfusion pressures. And <clears throat> when they uh, put the cuffs both in tandem and in each location, what they found was that the, the second cuff did not improve the retrograde leak point pressures over a single well-placed, well-sized proximal cuff. So no difference to put that extra cuff in loosely in a more uh, atrophic, uh, <clears throat> less robust position. So we've abandoned that. And it's important historically to consider that tandem cuffs were popularized in 1993 when there was no smaller cuff than a 4.5 centimeter cuff. Nowadays, we know that many of our sphincter patients have urethral circumference less than four centimeters. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so we were quite interested when the 3.5 centimeter cuff came out in 2010. The thing that changed that was uh, very important to re remember was that the measuring tape had the 3.5 centimeter mark added to it in 2010. So it was just never known who had a urethra <clears throat> any smaller than four centimeters. Uh, prior to that. So we believe that uh, the cuff should be uh, <clears throat> appropriately sized. It shouldn't be tight. It shouldn't cause an hourglass. But if it is loose, we believe that you can uh, <clears throat> attain uh, suboptimal outcomes. And so we measure it precisely without, as I say, an hourglass. <clears throat> and this is what you get, a perfect slit light appearance, very good continence. If you see any gaps in there, that's an unhappy patient. And uh, so there's been a lot of controversy about the 3.5 cuff and we don't use it as often now as we used to. However, I will say that in our experience of over 150 of these over time, as we've looked at this, <clears throat> the erosion rates of the 3.5 cuff are actually nearly identical to the 4.0 or larger cuffs it's the radiation that really makes a difference. And you see in radiated patients, no matter what size cuff you put on them, they are more likely to have cuff erosion events. So we believe it's, it's the patient history and the comorbidities more than the cuff size if it's uh, sized appropriately. Over the years, we've come to believe really it's the pressure regulating balloon that is usually the culprit. And when you do a revision surgery, I encourage you to remove the pieces of the previous system and interrogate them. And here you can see two uh, <clears throat> small pinholes in this system. If there's any defect whatsoever in this thin membrane, the pressure is lost, the device will be non-functional. <clears throat> we recently, uh, just this month, had an article published in the Gold Journal <clears throat> showing that if the balloon is palpable and loose and has herniated, this is a, a correctable cause of recurrent stress incontinence. So 
<clears throat> when we look in there, we feel that balloon, we see a slight defect of a millimeter or two. If we make an incision, put the new balloon beneath the belly of the rectus muscle, <clears throat> that patient can use that, that uh, <clears throat> the pump and, and activate that system immediately. So they have the benefit of immediate improvement of continence. And uh, as you can see, pre and post-op in 20 some patients over the years, these patients went from three or four pads a day down to one or less. So, so a simple uh, replacement of a palpable, uh, mobile, uh, herniated balloon is a nice way to salvage these cases. And then finally, what do we do when uh, things go wrong? Um, I'll start with um, an experience that we had uh, in thinking of the urethra as a hormonally responsive uh, structure, that is uh, a sex organ. <clears throat> and, uh, and then to talk a little about erosions and the relationship of hypogonadism. So for the residents in the audience, um, if you have an AUS patient that comes in with this picture, <clears throat> poor function of the system, pain, and what I call pumpitis, the pump is inflamed. What's happening here is you've got an erosion of the cuff, there's urinary seepage surrounding the pump, which becomes secondarily infected, <clears throat> and they present looking like this. If you see this, you gotta do a cystoscopy, confirm that you have an erosion. And uh, when you see this, um, we take this patient to the OR and we remove the cuff and the pump and uh, usually the balloon as well. Um, <clears throat> one day I had a patient ask me in a busy clinic, why do I keep having these erosions? Uh, he had had two erosions and he was kind of pale and uh, also kind of frail. And I, I thought, well, let me check your testosterone level. And it was low. So we started checking testosterone levels on erosion patients. And we wondered whether the urethra, you know, was uh, androgen uh, uh, susceptible. And uh, this is our latest data now as we've looked at 161 patients. What we find is in the 42 erosion patients, 71%, nearly three quarters of those patients have hypogonadism with a mean of 200. In the patients who had normal function, no erosion, you had normal uh, serum testosterone levels and a hypogonadism level of less than 50%. So these are showing to be highly statistically significant trends. Uh, so armed with this information, uh, if you plot this out, you can see the Kaplan-Meier on a eugonadal versus hypogonadal patient. <clears throat> this is an independent risk factor for cuff erosion. And we think it's interesting. And when I asked my chairman Klaus about this, he said, well, let's look at some tissue. So we went to our database of uh, urethroplasty tissue, <clears throat> and we looked at uh, patients who had had an anastomotic uh, procedure with urethra excised and had serum testosterone levels within two years of that surgery. <clears throat> and we did some uh, uh, very specialized staining looking at the androgen-mediated uh, angiogenesis mechanism, uh, specifically this uh, <clears throat> receptor called TI2, which is well known um, <clears throat> as a marker for the androgen-mediated uh, angiogenesis uh, pathway. And we had 11 patients with tissue, uh, half of them, uh, five had low testosterone, uh, six had normal, and we stained them for androgen receptors and vessels. And here you can see that the uh, hypogonadal patients had much lower uh, vascular count within the spongiosum. And when you compared serum testosterone versus the stained pickup of androgen receptors tied to and vessel count, you found significant trends in all these areas. So, so we believe that the urethra is a sex organ. And, and this brings up a lot of questions because we see that nearly half of these patients are hypogonadal when we see them. And about 16% are on androgen deprivation. So about a third have de novo hypogonadism. And if we're factoring in libido and feelings of wellness and strength and energy levels and other things, we believe that continence uh, should be part of that equation. And this may represent a, a, a pathway to medically optimize uh, some of these patients going forward. Of course, 
we want to consider their PSA uh, status, and we always get a PSA at the same time to uh, address their cancer burden. We wouldn't want to uh, treat them uh, with testosterone if they were actively uh, undergoing treatment, but if they're NED, this could be uh, certainly a, a something worth considering. And the patients we have treated <clears throat> are very happy to uh, do everything possible to, to prevent either a first erosion or a recurrent erosion. So I'll finish uh, with some of my thoughts on cuff erosion. Um, we've seen what it looks like. We've seen some of the factors that uh, cause it. Now, what do we do when, it, when we have that patient in the OR? Uh, well, I could tell you as a, a traumatologist that uh, uh, leaving a, uh, a, a urethra with a big hole in it is not a great idea. And let me uh, add further that if you leave a, a hole in the urethra in an incontinent patient, it's an even worse idea. So we know it's gonna be prone to scar, abscess, and, uh, and fistula. And so this is a patient who had uh, two cuffs erode and formed two strictures. Um, and here are some very recent patients I just had who had had previous uh, cuff erosions elsewhere, sustaining fistulas. Now this has to require another operation and repair before we get in there to uh, redo the uh, AUS procedure. So I believe it's a fundamental, uh, you know, fundamentally good medicine to correct the hole at the time of the removal of the device. And here's another patient with a huge diverticulum sustained as a result of an unrepaired uh, AUS cuff erosion. So what we have advocated for is immediate uh, repair, what I call an in situ repair. This is not a, uh, a detailed, uh, lengthy, time consuming procedure. It's as a, a, a macro uh, repair uh, with, uh, we use 2 0 monocryl suture, full thickness closure, just to reapproximate these edges. And here you can see most of these erosions tend to occur ventrally, and usually between five and eight sutures from one end to the other. Uh, full thickness will reapproximate this uh, such that it can heal. Here's a patient 89 years old with a 360 degree erosion. We take that cuff out, we repair it, and here he is with an intact uh, urethra. Now we can take this patient back and he successfully had a transcorporal procedure. The transcorporal operation is a good operation, but we reserve it for patients who have had a prior erosion. The advantage really is it puts a cuff in a new place. You can see in blue the site of the previous cuff, which we always place them as proximal as possible there in the lowest part of the, uh, the bulb. When we do a transcorporal, we're gonna be in a fresh area. We're gonna be in the mid and distal bulb. So we have virgin tissue planes, and this is a big advantage in these patients who have a lot of scar tissue in the bulb, especially if they may have an implant or some other structure. Uh, to deal with. But um, we, we just have this article now coming out. We were going to present it at the AUA. We looked at the erosion patterns of transcorporal versus standard um, AUS uh, cuff erosion patients in this heat map. And what we found was that ventral cuff erosions are the most common in both populations. So that casts a little bit of doubt on the protective effect of the transcorporal operation. We don't believe it's a panacea. We don't do it in patients who haven't had some prior uh, urethral surgery or cuff erosion because there's really no uh, demonstrable protective effect that we could uh, really visualize uh, looking at the patterns of erosions over 13 years here. And so uh, to summarize, what do we do in these uh, dead enders who come in with recurrent erosions? We've uh, used this technique of permanent bulbar urethral ligation, which I have to thank Ken Angermeyer for uh, presenting at the AUA some 10 years ago. We started fooling around with this and, and this is our uh, initial experience. Uh, we're updating it now, we have about 20 and we no longer tie off the distal end because uh, these patients are prone to having micro abscesses and small leaks. And if they develop a small pocket uh, in there, it, you can compress it and drain it out the penis. 
so it's nice to have that uh, site for egress if they have a little inflammatory process going on until you get them uh, back to the operating room. We are using some Botox in the bladder and trying to upsize their suprapubic tubes to help with this. But I'd say in about two thirds of patients, you can attain uh, dryness, uh, but many of them have bad bladders and they're prone to break down. They don't heal as well as other urethral operations for sure. So uh, some, uh, some mixed success with this operation, but for the, the dead ender who wants to be dry, we think it's a good operation. So to summarize, there's three factors influencing the outcomes. Uh, you may have a, a patient with poor protoplasm. You may have a device that fails spontaneously. But as a surgeon, we can do everything possible to put the right size cuff in the right place and optimize the conditions for uh, success uh, for the AUS patient. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Mori. That was a great talk. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jay Simham. He's from Philadelphia and is vice chair at the Fox Chase and Einstein Healthcare Network. Uh, Jay is really a dynamic speaker and is one of the rising stars in neurologic reconstruction. Um, on a personal note, Jay has had a lot of USC ties. He was Leo Domanian's chief resident, as well as uh, served as mentor to many of our trainees here that end up doing training here at USC. Um, Jay's a great friend and I really appreciate our travels around the world. And here's his talk on where he believes the penile implant um, future is going. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Hopefully this, uh, this is showing, yes? All right, great. Well, uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Dr. Gill, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, certainly for the invitation. Um, I, I really look forward to the next uh, remaining 60 minutes of, of this morning. So um, to get started, here are my disclosures. Um, you know, when I think about penile implants, I think about it in the context of really any operation we do in urology and, and, and surgery in general. All of us as surgeons are trying to promote surgical success. And if you really were to distill that down into several components, we can argue you know, hopefully successfully, that, that technical performance of an operation is one important component to promoting surgical success. And, and equal to that is probably perioperative management of any condition. And so with both of those combined, people really can have and hope for the most optimal patient outcome. And I would submit, of course, if you're listening, that you know, we heard a great talk by Dr. Mori regarding sphincters, and we're soon to hear a great talk, I know, by Dr. Angermeyer about complication management. But in the penile implant space, the technical aspect of doing most virginal penile implant procedures is really something that has not changed that much over the past you know, period of years. You know, the, the tenets of the operation are the same. We want proximal corporotomies. We want to follow some surgical principles. And ordinarily, we're going to have a successful outcome. But I think if you look closely at the perioperative management of patients over the past five to 10 years, I think that really is where the needle has moved in terms of promoting the most optimal patient outcome in penile implant recipients. But as a quick disclaimer, you know, as, as Jeff was just alluding to, the overwhelming majority of my practice is highly surgical. It's just that in regards to GU prosthetics, I think the perioperative management of these patients becomes that much more critical if we want to promote the most optimal outcome. So as a paradigm shift then, the question is, what are the things that are out there in terms of perioperative management for penile implants that's really changed over the past period of years? And so I certainly remember a time when I was going through training that we managed uh, penile infections very differently than maybe how they should be managed. And so at the time, you know, it was taught to me, well, the, a patient has a penile implant, remove it and get the infection better and, and go back in and do a delayed re-implant in that patient. And, uh, you know, at the early part of the 2010 decade, the Sexual Medicine Society was asked to really comment on penile implant infections and create a consensus document. And so in the Gold Journal, it was actually published as a consensus document that there in fact was no consensus on management of infections. So many surgeons like myself 
really had to rely on historic landmark papers. So this is a great series, uh, you know, huge, huge name in prosthetic urology, Dr. Mulcahy, that came up with what he would even call a largely arbitrary recommendation in terms of management of the infected penile implant case. But it did revolutionize infection management. And for many years, we were using this type of an algorithm to managing patients. And, and patients had reasonably good outcomes with it. But still, when you look at contemporary data, the overwhelming majority of patients still underwent an explant only and salvage implants were really not performed in reasonable volume. But for me, you know, a guy that's developed, you know, busy practice with implants, I started to face the patient that had what I would call an unintended consequence of removing a device alone and allowing for the infection to heal. This is a patient that was referred to us that had a penile implant months ago uh, that was removed for infection. And then we were asked to then replace an implant. And so this is something that we needed to do in terms of a complete ventral approach. Uh, um, you know, the corpora needed an exca excavation of sorts, and you could see the urethra is scarred, everything is scarred. Cosmetically, the patient might perceive to be okay, but on the ventral surface of his penis, they have a, you know, somewhat of a disfiguring scar. And, and even more so, these types of patients start to report that they lose length. And so this is a great study out of the University of Miami where they looked at patients who were undergoing salvage or delayed reimplantation. And they really showed that even if you wait six weeks to go back in and put in an implant after a device was removed for infection, the reduction in penile length is just below four centimeters. And, and again, you know, most of the penile implant patients are length crazed. And so it's very difficult knowing this data to really try to move towards delayed reimplantation. We should really be moving towards um, concomitant salvage. So let's take a look back again, you know, at what is being done currently. And, and this is a great one of the leaders in infection management, if not the leader in infection management for penile implants, has shown that the malleable implant has done great in the most severe infected cases. And so we have modified our approach to now doing malleable implants as a salvage strategy during um, um, uh, removal of devices. Um, and, and when you look at the individual components of the Mulcahy protocol, which I presented earlier, you know, I think important work has been done by Dr. Menares' group out of Boston University, really picking apart all the various components of the classic salvage protocol and really demonstrating that maybe peroxide doesn't need to be used at all due to its deleterious properties. And that betadine, which was used at 5% strength, can probably be diluted far greater than 5%, and patients seem to be doing really well with this. Again, a great Martin Gross study, um, and we've contributed on a recent one that's going to be published in the Journal of Urology to try to understand some of the bacteria and infections, has demonstrated a really high rate of anaerobic infections, candidal infections, and meth-resistant staph aureus, and, and ultimately, AUA and EAU guidelines don't cover a sizable proportion of these patients. Again, you look at a subcohort analysis, a lot of patients with penile implants can have fungal infections. And I would end with this level of paradigm to say that we have shifted. And I would really make a strong argument that you know, the penile implant surgeon should shift from the AUA recommendations that are, that are above on the table above to really what we do perioperatively now, which is an either or, an ampicillin to cover um, the anaerobics with genomycin, um, with fluconazole, if in the highest risk patient, or, you know, vancomycin with zosin, also with fluconazole. Intraoperatively, if you're able to coat your device, um, then, then we've also added antifungal coverage in these patients. And so, again, a big take home for me in terms of perioperative management for, for patients undergoing penile implants are the, are the points up here. Betadine, you know, we could use in a very dilute way. Peroxide should be removed for salvage procedures, and we should really consider uh, broadening our antibiotic coverage for these kinds of patients. And again, this is in an effort to most optimize outcomes following penile implantation. Another paradigm that I hold uh, near and dear to me is this concept that patients have pain following surgery. No surgery has an effect where patients can report that they have absolutely zero pain. 
every surgery patients have pain. And so I remember certainly again, when I was going through training, pain was seen actually as a sixth vital sign. We were told if patients have pain, in fact, I was taught, well, treat their pain. You know, giving narcotics doesn't actually make someone dependent on narcotics. But then of course, recently, and, and more than recently, it's been understood that an, an opioid crisis exists in this country. And this is 2020 data that, you know, there are 170 million people in this uh, country that have an opioid addiction problem. And this is the most sobering for me. If you look at 11% of US counties, there are more opioid prescriptions written than the actual number of people that reside in that county. To me, that's staggering. And so the prescription rate's tremendously high, the heroin use is extremely high, and ultimately, how does that relate to surgery? If you look at low-risk surgeries um, that are done for short-stay short stay or um, um, over, you know, outpatient-type surgeries, it's been shown that a relative risk of 44% increase in opioid dependence at one year following surgery um, exists if you take medicines, pain medicines, seven days following short stay surgery. And similarly, the CDC has reported that patients have a 14% absolute risk increase of opioid dependence at one year following a short stay surgery if they were on narcotic pain medicine seven days following surgery. So, you know, for me, how does that relate to penile implants? Again, this is the type of video that we've published that looks at you know, surgical strategies, techniques. It's a technique type video to show some of the challenges you might face in, in placing a difficult implant in a challenging scenario. This is a patient that had Fournier's gangrene. We were asked to reconstruct their penis and scrotum with skin grafts, we did. Several years later, the patient represented to our uh, center for a penile implant consideration. It was a very challenging conversation, numerous risks certainly, but ultimately we moved forward with the implant and had a positive outcome. And, and the video really talks about some of the strategies we undertook to do that implant safely. But more important than this, at least what I found in my practice was, again, a large proportion of patients were suffering in pain following the surgery, and it was paralyzing my ability to offer them the most optimal care postoperatively. So I took it, you know, really uh, to heart, and we tried to understand pain. And so this is a very, uh, you know, simple, you know, characteristic drawing of how pain works. Generally, pain is perceived from local inflammation uh, and from nerve damage from surgery. There are inflammatory mediators that are released like the ones listed. They target the peripheral nervous system, synapses to the spinal cord and supraspinal centers, and ultimately, pain is perceived. And so it stands to reason that if you're able to create a multimodal pathway that targets these various inflammatory mediators, you should be able to reduce pain. Now, the important thing though is, is in urology, at least at the time we were thinking about these types of things, there were studies like this, again, an important study, but in the oncology space. And what was done at Hopkins was they looked at, you know, robotic prostatectomy patients and really demonstrated that, well, you know what, for prostatectomy, the average patient just doesn't have a lot of pain. They only use around three tablets of oxycodone after their surgery, even though they were prescribed dramatically more than three tablets of oxycodone. But I don't think that necessarily translates to penile implants. And I think for those in the audience that are listening that do a fair amount of implants, pain management is a significant concern. And so looking again at the literature as, as to what has been done in penile implants, it becomes clear that actually a lot had been done, but they were all limited in terms of their ability to assess pain using validated questionnaires. It was very challenging to follow patients greater than one week, and much of the data was non-generalizable. So we came together and at our institution, we were um, able to put together a pilot study uh, uh, looking at a novel multimodal analgesic regimen. We had good results with that, but I think one that we're, we're, we're even more proud of is a multi-institutional series where again, we, we took a prospective cohort of patients and followed a multimodal pain management regimen in a prospective cohort and compared that to a historic cohort that received opioid only pain medicine. We had a, you know, ex a strong exclusionary criteria in order to make sure the groups um, sort of matched and there were no inherent biases. And you know, I really wanna credit my chief resident who's going into a career in reconstruction as well, Dr. Lucas. And you know, it was an effort to 
you know, uh, compiled data across four sites. And ultimately, we were able to really have, I think, um, some impactful change here. Here's the pathway that we, we used. It's a high dose analgesic, acetaminophen, uh, gabapentin for neuropathic pain control, and a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that's long acting. We give that to sensitize the pain receptor in the holding area. We supplant that with pudendal and dorsal penile nerve blocks intraoperatively. And then we continue that on a scheduled way. We continue what was given in the holding area in a scheduled fashion in order to control patient's pain. We then use a validated questionnaires that, you know, these are the, the, the questionnaires that the anesthesia docs and the pain management docs use that have been well validated both internally, externally, and are really historically proven studies, uh, you know, questionnaires to work. And, and, you know, when you look at the data, again, huge series of uh, an, a, a huge multi-institutional effort, we were able to demonstrate dramatic reduction in pain perioperatively. But I think importantly, we were also able to show that the narcotic reduction long term was dramatically lower and the number of patients requiring refills was lower as well. So multimodal analgesia can work um, and, and we're happy that we've been able to show it sort of in a generalizable fashion that it can, it can really traverse the recovery process throughout the entire recovery period. Patients have decreased pain and fewer inpatient opioid requirements, and certainly that holds true following their stay in the hospital as well. We're lucky in that this type of quality improvement initiative within prosthetics can really apply to the various domains throughout urology. So we've been able to do that at our department here in Philadelphia. And you know, from just a management question that comes up, when we have patients that do represent or call us with pain, we titrate up our gabapentin in an effort to control their pain more effectively, and we've had outstanding success in doing that. Ultimately, I think, you know, we have some closing points here um, before I hand this back off to Dr. Lowe Doyle. You know, hopefully what I've been able to talk about is this concept of perioperative management and the considerations that we put into maybe the circumstances of an operation are just as important as the technical aspects of the operation alone. From an infection standpoint, I've hopefully conveyed to you this idea that we should consider anaerobic and antifungal coverage in high-risk patients. And salvage cases really should use um, a heavily diluted abetadine and we should avoid peroxide. And finally, from pain management, our uh, multimodal pathway that we've talked about, I think has had great generalizable and reproducible results uh, across the country. And, and my hope is that we should be able to continue to expand this throughout urology in an effort to avoid narcotics. I wanna again thank the USC Institute of Urology for the invitation today. And I look forward to the conversation and discussion at the end of the 60 minute presentation. Thanks Jay. Great talk, and uh, really your, your multimodal pain pathway has really changed the game in terms of perioperative management of patients with penile implants. So I really appreciate your work with that. Thank you. So our final speaker is Dr. Angermeyer. He joins us from the Cleveland Clinic, and he really is one of the world's premier reconstructive and prosthetic urologists. He has extensive experience in complex reconstruction of the urinary tract, and really is at the cutting edge of placing prosthetics in the most difficult of settings. Patients that have previously had reoperative bellies, transplant patients, prior cystectomies. And because of that, we wanted to hear firsthand how he avoids AUS complications and his advice on how to best management, manage them when they arise. Thanks, Dr. Engelmeyer. You're welcome. Can everyone see the screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, Again, I want to thank uh, uh, we Indy. Cannot, Ken, we cannot see your slides, though. Oh, hang on one second. Let's see, share screen. Perfect. Got it. Okay. Perfect. How's that? Perfect. Good. Okay. So, um, I just want to again thank Indy and, and, and Jeff for asking me to, uh, to speak today. I'd like to also say hello to all my friends and colleagues out at, out at USC. Um, the, when I was invited to give this lecture, it, um, it was mentioned to, that the topic would be 
you know, management of complications of prosthetic surgery, but I thought that was a little bit too large of a topic to cover everything. So I sent Jeff an email and asked him if he would like for me to focus on um, AUS or IPP and, and he mentioned AUS. So that's what I'm gonna focus on today. Um, there'll be a little bit of an overlap with what um, Al talked about, but hopefully uh, there'll be a little bit of additional information and we'll elaborate on some, uh, some of those topics. So there are a number of problems that can be seen um, following uh, artificial sphincter surgery. I've kind of listed the ones here that I have seen and I think are, are, are the most common. And you know, one of the issues is, is that patients love these devices so much. They, um, as was mentioned, they completely change people's lives. And, um, and so when something goes wrong with them, they really want them to work again. They want another device. You know, it doesn't matter if they've had two or three and they've had erosions and problems, they'll always come back asking, asking for another one. And this can really make you sweat sometimes because you, know, you really wanna help them. You wanna you know, give them another device and, uh, and they'll, they'll be putting the pressure on you to do so. so some of these, uh, uh, hopefully we'll present some tricks here and things to help, uh, help with that. So how often do patients need reoperative surgery? Um, there, was a, um, there was a review um, by, you know, at the Mayo Clinic um, of a large number of patients and, um, and they looked at just, you know, device survival and, you know, need for uh, reoperation. And at five years, it was about 72%. 10 years, 56%, and 15 years, 41%. And when you look at other studies that have been published on a similar topic, they're all in this ballpark. So these are actually the numbers that I use when I counsel patients. You know, a lot of them ask, you know, how long will this last? When do, will I need it replaced? And so um, these are the numbers that I give them, um, you know, in this regard. So let's start with infection. We just heard a little bit about penile prosthesis infection. Um, in, you know, it's really almost impossible at times to distinguish uh, infection from erosion. And, and so some of the data that talks about um, infection uh, for artificial sphincters um, might not be perfect, but in general, most studies would say the incidence is around 2%. Most common organisms are Staph aureus and Staph epi. Um, now inhibizone is an interesting issue with artificial sphincters. Um, you know, once uh, it was applied to penile prostheses, the company had the technology. I guess it was a natural step for them to apply them to the artificial sphincter. They can't put it on the PRB because the very thin lining of the balloon won't tolerate the process. It won't tolerate the heat that's used to cook the antibiotics onto the device. So you can only coat the pump and the cuff. Um, and it's really, you know, somewhat debatable whether it really is beneficial uh, for artificial urinary sphincter patients. First of all, if a patient gets an infection, salvage surgery for an AUS is not nearly as, you know, complicated generally as it is for a penile prosthesis. And so, you know, there might, for that reason, there might be some limited benefit in, you know, in applying it. And and there's also been at least one study that, is, that has shown that it really didn't improve the infection rate um, you know, very much at all. And, um, and actually when, the, when it first came out, I mean, the company came to several uh, opinion leaders and that sort of thing and they asked, you know, should we do this? There'll be extra cost. And I know that you know, my opinion was I, I wouldn't do it, but I think they, you know, they had the technology so they, they went ahead and did it. So inhibizone, I think for, for an artificial sphincter, has minimal benefit, but it's there. You, you, you know, if you want one without it, you have to special order it if you have a patient who's allergic to, doxy, to tetracycline or something and you want a device without it, you have to special order it. Um, but, but I think it probably is a limited benefit. Now pump malposition is, um, is uh, also a less common uh, problem. Um, pumps uh, you know, are placed from above, you stick them down into the scrotum, you can't really fix them in place, you know, a penile implant pump, you know, you can kind of, you know, either bring it through the dartos or use the dartos to kind of fix it in position if you want to, but these pumps you really can't, you just, from an upper incision, you just kind of shove it down into the, uh, into the scrotum and, um, um, and it just, you know, usually it ends up in the right spot, but sometimes it can end up too high in the scrotum, 
can be too posterior, it can be inverted or wrapped around the tubing. And the other thing, this really isn't a pump mount position, but when you're talking to someone and thinking about putting one in, you gotta look at their size. I mean, there are patients who can't reach their scrotum um, because of their, their, their big abdomen. And so obviously it wouldn't be a good candidate you know, for a device if they really you know, you know, just can't get down there to use it, obviously. Um, so what do we do for the, and, and there was one study that looked from the Mayo Clinic that, you know, had a uh, uh, incidence of this of 2.7%. Um, and um, we just opened the upper incision and then either re uh, reposition or completely replace the pump and then instruct the patient to gently pull down on it, you know, for a few weeks post-op. We routinely do that just to kind of keep it uh, low in the scrotum and prevent it from riding, riding up high where it might be difficult to access. So cuff erosion, um, Al talked a little bit about cuff erosion already. Um, when cuff erosions occur early, most people accept that this is a technical problem that occurred during the operation, usually dorsally during that difficult kind of fibrotic dissection, detaching the urethra off of the underlying corporal bodies, which is always most dense at 12 o'clock. Um, and getting around there can be difficult. That dissection should be done um, under direct vision sharply um, and, uh, and, and slowly um, and uh, in order to prevent that. Um, late erosions are usually due to poor vascularity of the urethra. And, um, and there are times when um, you, know, you just end up with a urethra that it just does not have enough vascular supply to support a cuff. Um, you know, that's, um, you know, that's the reality, reality of the situation. You know, this can be related to radiation therapy. Um, radiation therapy uh, in most series, not all, but in most series is associated with a higher rate of erosion. Um, I just, you know, before this lecture, I just kind of briefly look back at, at three, three years of recent data of mine of artificial urinary sphincter patients and about 60% of patients undergoing a primary implant or a revision where the whole device was replaced were radiated. So really it's become more the norm and not the exception. Um, so radiation is here and, and, um, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's probably gonna continue to increase that our patients have this. I think the robotic surgeons are getting better and better uh, at, at prostatectomy. And so most of those patients that have incontinence or a lot of them can be managed with a sling. So I think the percent of patients who've been radiated to get artificial sphincters will, will continue to increase. Cuff erosions are also more common in patients who've had a prior erosion and in patients that have had previous uh, urethroplasty, um, especially in estomatic repair where the urethra has been divided at one site and so there might be some compromise to blood flow through the spongiosum um, and, and could lead to a problem. Instrumentation is another cause of late erosion Everyone's aware of this. You know, if you have a Foley catheter, um, sometimes the device, depending on where the catheter is inserted, um, is not uh, de opened and deactivated. Um, but you want to use the smallest catheter possible for the shortest time, uh, and, and have the device properly de opened and deactivated uh, uh, with a with a catheter. But this will st still sometimes happen. Um, a meta a meta analysis done by Kurt McCammon a few years ago showed that the incidence of cup erosion was about 2.2 to 12 percent, you know, in various uh, previously published series. So what do we do with cuff erosions? Um, I'll uh, discuss this a little bit, and um, I'll just elaborate on it a little a little bit more. You know, if you have a small defect, as shown on the first slide. Um, probably, you know, most of those can be managed with uh, a catheter for three to four weeks. Um, there are, there are, you know, I've been to meetings where I've talked about repairing urethras and people have, have, you know, gotten up and said, oh, it's never necessary. You never need to repair the urethra. I mean, I don't agree with that, but, but there is that, um, that mindset out there in, in, in some areas. But it's certainly, I think if it's a small defect, you can do that. We get a VCUG at three to four weeks and if it's healed, you know, then we, uh, you know, go from there. However, um, large defects may lead to urethral stricture or extravasation as, uh, as Al pointed out. And I think in these, you should consider repair or reconstruction. Um, you can see here, this little bit of the urethra is all that's left, you know, so there's about an 80%, maybe a little more um, um, uh, erosion of this urethra with just this little bit intact. 
And really, if you just leave a catheter in this, I don't see how this doesn't um, you know, completely scar down um, afterwards. Um, we published a paper um, a few years ago uh, with our experience with cuff erosion management, and we identified 75 patients. They were a little bit older, 72 to 83 years. 52 were managed with a Foley catheter, eight with abbreviated urethroplasty, which is the technique that, that Al mentioned uh, during his lecture, where a part of the urethra is sutured together without full uh, mobilization. And then we actually did 15 anastomotic urethroplasties at the time of cuff removal. Um, and what we found in this study was that severe erosions, over 50% of their circumference uh, treated with Foley uh, catheter alone, were more likely to develop a stricture than mild erosions. And we had a, a much less incidence, a lower incidence of this in the patients who we did the repairs. And in the long term, there was no difference in probability of reimplantation between these above, between these groups. So this is just an example of what some of this might look like. This is a patient who you can see the cuff here and just had a really basically a full thickness erosion. Um, when you take the cuff out, here's the distal urethra, here's the proximal urethra, here's the catheter within. There's really virtually nothing uh, in between. And so we mobilized this and did a, uh, an astomotic repair. These defects, as you might expect, are always two centimeters in length, so they're not super long. And generally, it, unless it's just horrible in there, you can, you know, uh, you, you can, uh, in terms of fibrosis and periurethral uh, scarring, you can mobilize the urethra and get it together without too much difficulty. And what this does is this saves the patient an extra operation. So if you don't do this and leave a catheter, they scar down, then you have to do a urethroplasty, then you have to do the AUS later. By doing it at this time, you save them the urethroplasty. So you can go from this healed urethra then to another artificial uh, urinary sphincter at a later date. So it just, it saves them an operation and speeds up the process a bit. Um, and obviously cuff site strictures occur. I, I show some of these slides sometimes to the people who have told me that, that these don't occur, that you can just always leave a catheter, but clearly this is a patient that was referred from elsewhere and before they referred him, they did a, this uh, radiographic study, retrograde urethrogram, and you can see the, all of the extravasation. Superpubic catheter was placed and he completely scarred down and had to be uh, reconstructed before putting in another device. This is another patient with a cuff site stricture, and you can see here, um, you know, just full thickness spongiofibrosis, short segment, you know, it's only going to be the, the, the size of the cuff, um, but we went in and, and did an anastomotic repair. It healed, and then we were able to replace the device. So again, you, you avoid maybe having to do this by, by doing a repair of a bad erosion at the time of, uh, at the, at the, time of the explant uh, of the device. You can also get cuff site pseudodiverticulums. I call them pseudodiverticulums because they don't have the normal uh, mucosal lining of the, of the structure that they're coming from. But I think these are related to, um, um, you know, having that um, defect remain open and then either a urinoma develops or maybe even the cuff capsule fills, you know, because there is a capsule there. And if you just incise onto it a little bit, take the artificial sphincter out, it might seal back over and then urine can continue to fill that capsule and maybe it expands over time. Not 100% sure, but, but we've seen a few of these. This is a stone inside of this um, uh, di you know, pseudodiverticulum that we removed when we repaired it. He had some previous uh, in you know, periurethral injections uh, as well, which don't work. Um, you know, they were done before he was referred to us. Um, but this is, this is the large one. And so we just went in and explored this, got this huge bulge and opening it up. And what you can see after you open it up is this is the opening into the urethra. So this is the defect through which the urine was uh, filling this large uh, pseudodiverticulum and, and causing the problem. So, you know, maybe if this would have been closed at the time, it would have prevented this problem. Um, but these aren't, aren't super common, but, but we've seen a handful uh, uh, over the years. So, what do you do then when you have to put the device back in after an erosion or a urethroplasty? Well, patients, um, these two conditions um, present the highest risk for recurrent erosion, and that's been seen in a number of studies. So you really want to kind of stay away, especially in the case of a previous erosion, stay away from the site of the previous cuff. 
So um, Al mentioned this too, proximal cuff relocation um, is really a good procedure for this. And you can also do it for uh, atrophy in some cases if needed, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. But you can see here, this is uh, where the cuff previously was. And then you've got this really nice virgin, you know, proximal bulbous urethra here that you can then go around and, and, and move the cuff. And, you know, it's, it's robust. It's got a good, good looking blood supply and, uh, and it, it's a good maneuver for this particular patient. This is also when people were doing more of the uh, transverse scrotal approach, it was actually kind of nice because those, you know, we saw patients referred for erosion of those and this, this was always preserved. So we would always go there, but I don't think that's being done as much anymore. Transcorporal cuff is another uh, option that, um, that Al also mentioned. This can be used following an erosion or a urethroplasty. It obviates the need to dissect in the plane between the urethra and the corpora and prevents thinning of the dorsal urethra or intraoperative injury. So if you've had a previous dorsal uh, cuff erosion and it heals and scars down, or if you've had a urethroplasty where the urethra has been, sorry, mobilized, um, you know, to dissect in this plane, this really can get, you know, scarred and fibrotic and adherent to the corporal body. So, you know, the, the dissection ventrally and laterally is easy, but you get here and here and it gets tough. And so instead of trying to do that, you just enter the corporal bodies on each side and then dissect under that layer of tunica albuginea, essentially leaving that flap of albuginea on the urethra. And so really it, um, uh, you know, protects the dorsal half of the circumference of the urethra, you know, from a future erosion. And this is an example. So what we've done, this is a patient uh, who, um, he was radiated and, and uh, I believe had a previous uh, urethroplasty, but you can see it's kind of fibrotic and a little bit of fibrosis around the urethra, but the, the initial dissection is easy. But if you get here, then you have to go in this plane between the albuginia here and the urethra, and it can be very difficult. So we just open these up and uh, get around to make sure the space is sufficient. Sometimes when you get to the midline, you encounter the septal fibers and you have to transect those sharply to get a big enough space. And then we um, uh, place the, uh, the, the cuff around and reapproximate this edge, this lateral edge of the tunic albuginia to this lateral edge. Um, and you can see that on this final, final slide. Now, um, people often ask if you can put a penile implant in after one of these, and you can, I have. It just, it doesn't seem to, you know, prevent putting in a standard penile implant if you do this, um, procedure before the implant. However, if a patient already has a penile implant in place, I think doing a, a transcorporeal cuff is very difficult. I actually haven't done it because, you know, I've thought, well, maybe I'll be able to do it, but you get in there and the cylinders so fill the corpora that you usually can't. People have talked about doing it anyway and putting a graph there, but I, I just haven't really done it in the setting when the cylinders are already in place. And I'll just try to find an area of the urethra that I can uh, get around and, and, and hope for the best. Outcomes are pretty good. You know, these are high risk patients. This was a series actually that um, Al and, and, and I and our, our fellow uh, Ryan Morey combined on a few years ago presented at the AUA. There were 76 patients, 45% um, uh, were radiated. They had had uh, previous erosions, injuries, reconstructions. Success rate with a follow-up of 20 months on average uh, was about 79%, which is pretty good. 21% um, either had significant incontinence or, or were explanted, and about 15% had to be explanted. There is an increased uh, erosion uh, rate noted following urethral reconstruction, even with the transcorporal cuff. You do have to be careful of retention a little bit more uh, with the TC cuff. Um, it is, it, it's easy to put someone in with retention with the operation. The, I don't normally uh, use cystoscopy uh, in most of these cases, but with the TC cuff, I always do cystoscopy after the cuff is locked to look in and make sure it's not too tight because you can be fooled uh, on this. And uh, if it is too tight, we'll take it out and put in a bigger cuff. So just be careful with your measurement on these transcorporal cuffs. Un not all that common, but recurrent incontinence can be caused by detrusor overactivity or even decreased compliance. These things can be unmasked by improving the ability to store urine. So you may not realize it, you know, they're leaking, their bladder never fills. How do you know if they have urgency sometimes? And so 
um, if they develop uh, urge type symptoms um, after an AUS, um, you know, be sure to think of this. You can do urodynamics. You might see uh, uninhibited contractions, as you can see here. Compliance was fine, but you can see some uh, contractions. And then standard management, anticholinergics, Botox. We've Botoxed a few of these. We really haven't seen retention. You know, you'd, you'd worry about that. Oh, I'm a little afraid to Botox them. I don't want to have a guy with an AUS that needs a catheter, but we haven't really seen that. I think the guys that have this are usually radiated and their bladders are such that they don't really go into uh, retention that often with it. Fluid loss um, is another problem uh, that can require reoperation. The diagnosis is usually made on physical examination. Um, you can use a KUB if you place, if you use contrast in the device or you can do an ultrasound of the balloon if you use saline, that's what I use. Um, just a reminder about the volume of a sphere. Um, it's four thirds pi r cubed. So what you're looking for, I do my own ultrasound in the office with the machine that we have up there, the small parts probe. You're looking for a diameter of 3.4 centimeters. And if you do the math, that gives you a volume of 20 or 21 uh, ml. And that's about what you want in your balloon. So it's really easy to do. You just need a diameter. Um, and then you can calculate the, uh, the PRB volume. Whoops. Now in terms of leaks, um, Al mentioned about the, that, that in his experience, the PRB was the most common site of leak. In my hands, I have to admit, I think I've seen more in the cuff and it, there are some series out there that have also kind of confirmed that uh, in, in some studies, you know, they all can be a little bit different, but, um, but I have written, you know, on here that the cuff is the most common site. It usually happens at the crease. Um, you get a pinhole leak. PRB would be second pump very rarely leaks and the connectors never, I, I have never seen a quick connector fail in my career. Um, the old tie-on connectors used to fail, but the quick connectors never fail, um, even in a, in a, in a reoperative case, uh, if, if you use them. But you do have to be a little bit careful putting them on in a reoperative case because the tubing that's already in the patient is slippery and it'll slip out of the connector more easily than the new tubing. And so you just have to hold it carefully while you're, while you're using, uh, you know, while you're constricting the, uh, uh, crimping the connector. But once it's crimped, um, it, it does fine. And usually for fluid loss, I replace all components because most of the devices are more than three years out. I'll mention PRB migration or malposition. Um, it's been a general principle for a long time. The PRB has to be under the abdominal wall fascia for proper function. Um, and this is why we don't put them in the scrotum. You know, if, if they work fine in a different, you know, in, in soft tissue or somewhere else, we just put them in the scrotum. That would be so easy, but we don't. You have to put them under the fascia. These are a couple patients that, that I've seen. Clearly, these are outside. This was a patient who uh, was referred from elsewhere. The operative note indicated they had done a, a, an ectopic balloon placement with an incision through the fascia, but it ended up out here. This is a patient that had a space of retzius balloon that had a hernia repair elsewhere on that same side. And then afterwards he was markedly incontinent. This is his CT. And both of these cases, we just relocated it underneath the fascia and, uh, and they did perfectly fine. And, and I do all of my balloons uh, in an ectopic location. You know, Al's been a big proponent of this. Uh, I do it a little bit differently um, in that I always make an incision uh, along the lower abdomen through which I place the pump and the ectopic balloon by making a very small incision in the rectus fascia and just dissecting medial to it and going underneath. But, but I do 100% of my balloons now ectopic uh, because you know we're making a second incision up there anyway. Now urethral atrophy, this is a tricky one. Um, people really, it's not really clear what this is and this can be a lot of different things to a lot of different people. A capsule forms around all components of the prosthesis, whether it's an AUS, IPP, and these capsules can contract over time <clears throat> a little bit. If you, if you have a patient who has fluid loss for an IPP or an AUS and you're replacing a device and the reservoir, for instance, if you're going to put the reservoir in the same spot, and you go in and you try it, this, the cap, it's too small. You can't get it in and you have to fracture the capsule and make it bigger in order to get it in the same spot. So these capsules can contract. And so when, you, when this capsule forms around the cuff, you know, it can contract a little bit and, you know, and the cuff is, is typically, you know, uh, 
constricting this part of the urethra. And so um, all patients basically 100% are gonna have some degree of capsular narrowing at the cuff side. It's universal in, in, in every patient. You know, in some patients, that this patient, it's fairly mild. It's really not, you know, not too much. And you probably wouldn't have to do anything. You just put the cuff back at the same spot. Um, if you do incise or excise the capsule, it does allow this part of the urethra to expand, indicating that the tissues underneath, you know, we're still pretty healthy. Um, I don't routinely do that, but sometimes if you, if I go in to do a remove or place, um, and when I go to put in the new cuff, I find that posteriorly the capsule has con the space is constricted, and so when you go to put the new cuff in, it ends up kind of C-shaped back there. It won't fully expand, and I don't like that. So I, I go back in the back here and I I, I incise the capsule uh, proximally and distally so that the cuff can fit in nice and flat again, like it does when you put it in the first time. And sometimes when I do that, some of this uh, lateral or anterior capsule will Will, will come off and then it'll expand a little bit, but you don't, you don't have to do that uh, during a replacement, um, you know, unless it looks like it really needs it. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, you basically have a patient with recurrent incontinence, no other etiology identified. Uh, maybe there's a central cuff lumen on cystoscopy. There have been a number of studies that have looked at this, but numbers that seem to be pretty accurate would be 7.9, 8.2, around 8% of primary implants require revision for atrophy. It usually re occurs relatively late. The other interesting thing is the PRBs also can lose pressure over time. Um, uh, Tony Mundy and his group did a study a few years ago looking at that, and that's not surprising. And something I always expected kind of happened, and that's why we often will replace the entire device for cases of atrophy to get a new balloon and everything, um, because it's hard to believe that, you know, that that balloon is going to hold the same pressure for 5, 10, 15 years, um, you know, and, and there is some, some weakening over time. So what I do for atrophy, um, if the device has been in place for less than three years, then I'll often go in and just try and uh, do a cuff downsizing. Um, if it's been in for more than three years, I'll replace everything, remeasure the cuff, relocate it if needed, usually not needed, or do a TC cuff again if needed, but, but often not. This three years is a very arbitrary number. You could say three to five. That's not written in stone. That's not proven in a study anywhere. General concept is if the device has been in for a while, I replace everything. If it's been in a relatively short period of time, I would just you know, downsize the cuff. Um, and when replacing the entire device, I always just use the same size PRB. Um, uh, Jeff uh, has a recent paper um, uh, looking at 71 uh, 80 centimeter water PRBs, and there was a little bit higher risk of device failure with them, but I really haven't seen, seen a need to ever do that. I've never pl placed a 71 80 uh, PRB in a bulbous urethral cuff, um, and so we just always use the 61 70. Lastly, I'm not going to dwell on this, um, but sometimes a patient with a cuff in place develops a recurrent bladder neck contracture or even prostatic stones that need to be managed. And this can be a little bit tricky. Obviously, uh, there is some risk of cuff erosion. Uh, you want to use a small scope with a laser if you can. They do make a 19 French resectoscope. We have one that has a Collings knife that you can sneak through a cuff and incise a bladder neck contracture. If you need a bigger device, you can open the perineum, unlock the cuff, I irrigate and then I close it with staples and then we do our cystoscopic procedure and then we go back in and relock it. You can also do an antegrade approach for stone, for instance. This patient had a history of cryo radiation, had an AUS, developed these stones um, within the bladder neck and prostatic area. And so we just kind of went in from above through a, you know, a suprapubic puncture uh, endoscopically. Did this with one of my stone, uh, my endourology colleagues went in with the laser and, and got him cleaned out nicely from above, left you know, a catheter in for a bit, and, and he did well with that. And um, obviously, try to avoid long-term ISC in these patients with an artificial sphincter. I do have a handful of patients, not many, who have just horrible refractory bladder neck contractures who do pass a catheter uh, once a day or so through their device. It's not optimal, but it can be done. Uh, they just have to be careful and understand that that there is a bit of a risk. And I think that's it. So 
uh, thanks again, and we'll be happy to look at Jeff's case or, or answer any questions that come up. Thanks, Dr. Ingemeyer. That was a perfect talk and really a, a great segue into our case of uh, time permits, Dr. Gill. What do you think? Um, how long will it take? Probably about five minutes. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, so I just wanted to run through a, a typical complex patient that we see here in our high volume prosthetic practices. So this patient's 65 year old male who presents with incontinence, requires three to four pads per day and one pull up depends at night. The patient has a history of radical prostatectomy and had adjuvant radiation two years ago. His PSA is now undetectable. He's a diabetic, his hemoglobin A1C is eight. He also has, a hyper has hypertension as well as coronary artery disease as an ex smoker. So my question first to Dr. Mori is, um, you know, what is your initial evaluation of this patient presenting with this history? Um, do you go to the cystoscopy? Well, um, you know, I would query him on obstructive symptoms, but uh, typically uh, we would reserve that for intraoperative use, uh, <clears throat> unless there was some history of a bladder neck contracture. The patient's been radiated, so we're going to do an AUS, not a sling in that patient, but we'll also do the standing cough test just to confirm that the patient does have severe incontinence uh, objectively, and we take that patient to the OR for a cysto and an AUS without urodynamics. Dr. Mori, could you switch on your video so that we can see you as well? And uh, Dr. Angermeyer, do you think there's any role for your dynamics preoperatively? Or yeah, this, this, you know, the evaluation of these patients varies a lot. Um, and, you know, a lot of good people, do, you know, get great results doing it different ways. My personal preference is to do cystoscopy in the office on every AUS patient, just so we're not surprised when we get down there. I don't want to you know, have a situation where I have to do an incision and not do the AUS and the patient might be surprised, you know, afterwards or something. So I scope them all. I reserve urodynamics for patients who are radiated just, and not really, it doesn't really change your operation, but post-op, um, if they have, you know, if they have documented uh, overactivity or they have poor compliance, we might watch that patient more carefully. He might be someone who we start on anticholinergic sooner than later. Um, and um, so I do it more for their post-op uh, uh, follow-up and management decisions rather than, it doesn't really affect the operation, but it affects us afterwards. So Jay, do you have, any, do you have a uh, hemoglobin A1C cutoff for AUS patients? Um, I, I do not. Um, I think there are some people that uh, might have those types of cutoffs. Um, I was asked to sort of look at this just recently. And, you know, for us, we have been aggressive at managing their blood sugars perioperatively. So if um, they're a poor blood sugar control patient and they have, you know, bad control at the time of the operation, we will aggressively manage it then. Um, but we do not use hemoglobin A1C cutoff. So the, the patient had cystoscopy, it showed a relatively healthy urethra, there's some subtle fibrosis at the external sphincter. Um, the bladder neck had some narrowing at 18 French, but otherwise we're able to easily get it into the bladder and the bladder was benign. Um, the patient had a high volume leak during a standing leak test. So options, I know Dr. Mori said that, you know, an AUS really is the only option for this patient. My, my question to Jay and Dr. Angermeyer is, you know, do you also agree that AUS is the only option for this patient? Um, I, mean, I, yeah. oh, go, go I mean, I, 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 I agree. For yeah. radiated patients, we do not employ slings and we would, we would do an artificial sphincter. Sorry, Dr. Angermeyer. That's okay. No, I, I agree, not only because of his radiation, but it's high volume leakage. Now, I have to say that I, I, I do an I maybe have done 10 slings on radiated patients. If they are only leaking a pad or two a day and on cystoscopy, if their tissues look really healthy, um, I, I have done it. So I don't rule them out immediately if they've been radiated, but this guy's leaking too much to be considered and he's radiated on top of it. And so, uh, yeah, so Dr. Mori, how long would you wait before uh, placing the AUS after completion of radiation therapy? You have a patient that's desperate to get his incontinence under control. 
Yeah, so they'll, they'll typically come before the radiation. And uh, if you can catch them before the radiation, I, I think that's a nice way to do it. Um, I think if you wait a month or two, it's probably okay. Um, there's going to be chronic long-term microvascular damage from the radiation, but it really doesn't change your perineal operation in terms of getting around the urethra at all. So maybe six to eight weeks. So do any of you guys use the 5160 in this patient that has diabetes, has a vascular path, as well as history of radiation, or is your default the 6170? I use a 6170 in all, all bulbous urethral cuffs. Same here. Same here. And so how long would you wait before activating this patient, uh, Dr. Mori? Six weeks. I wouldn't change anything with it. OK. And any uh, changes to your cuff sizing strategy, Dr. Engermeyer? No, you know, the majority of our patients now, as I mentioned, are radiated. And so we just, we would just do our typical AUS operation and this patient, you know, measure him and, you know, just, and put in the size that looks like it, it requires. So we actually placed a 5160 reservoir and a 4.0 centimeter cuff. And the only reason for that was his actual, the urethra itself looked a little bit less vascularized during the perineal dissection. Because of that, as well as this history of coronary artery disease, as well as smoking history, we did wait a full 12 weeks before activating him. It's now two pads per day, but has new onset OAB. And so I think Dr. Ingermeyer touched on this during his talk, but uh, we treated him with Mirabegron and is now down to one pad per day. So six months later, he said, can you fix my penis? Of course. So now that he's using his AUS pump well, he now wants the penile implant. So Dr. Mori, you know, what is your preoperative discussion and is there any hard and fast contraindications to placing a penile implant in these patients in particular? Well, uh, I, I'll say that, you know, at this point, I'm looking for a very motivated patient. Practically all of these AUS patients also have ED. So theoretically you could put an implant in all of them, but I'm looking for somebody who's younger, healthier, highly motivated, and, and then I'm, I start to entertain the risk of doing it. I will say, you, you know, I always use 12 to 14 French catheters in the operating room on all of these patients. I don't use a 16 ever because a lot of them have some bladder neck issues. And, and those 12 French catheters are a little flimsy. So you've got to make sure that you retain, that you retrieve urine before you blow up the balloon when you place that, when you're doing your IPP on it. Um, let the patient know that they do have a little bit higher risk uh, having both in there, that there may be a risk of having some uh, premature cuff erosion. But if they're highly motivated, healthy, and have a, a solid partner and a good story, then I'll usually go ahead and do it in a staged operation about three months later. So Dr. Angermeyer or Jay, um, would you ever consider doing a combination AUS and IPP uh, in this patient or in any patient? I'll let Dr. Angermeyer go first and then I'll jump in. Um, I um, uh, age before beauty, right, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, the um, yeah, I mean, it has to be, They. I try to talk people out of it, honestly, but, you know, there are patients, they'll come in and because of their insurance or because of some personal, you know, just some other situation, or they just really, really want it. So if a patient comes in and they really are adamant about it, I do it. I mean, I don't, I, it's a doable thing. I tell them it's a little more pain and swelling, longer recovery. If one gets infected, the other one could, even though it's uncommon, you know, and, and stuff like that. So I, I do it, but I try not to. Um, uh, my, if they say, doc, what do you think is best? I say, I put in the AUS, come back four to six months later, do the IPP. Yeah, I, um, I would uh, echo what Dr. Angermeyer just said. I think um, there are patients where I have, I even documented as such that I am meeting their motivation is what I write in the, in the chart. And so if I feel that I have to meet their motivation to do a combination implant, then we'll do one. Great. Well, thanks guys. I really appreciate you coming on board and really I think uh, all of us learned a lot and we look forward to having you in the future. Great. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. All right. I uh, just want to say that uh, 
Uh, guys, this was absolutely fantastic. Dr. Mori, Dr. Simhan, Dr. Angermeyer. This, these were three outstanding talks, and we've been seeing quite a few uh, across the range of urology in the past couple months. Uh, three outstanding talks have all the makings this one has of being a classic. Uh, and I don't say that lightly, guys. Um, I personally learned a lot, but that's a low bar. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, the folks did. So, you know, uh, just so that you know, um, this recording of the entire hour and a half is going to go in the um, urology 60 minutes. Uh, I think it's Facebook or, or YouTube or whatever it is. But bottom line, it is going to be stored there. And we have in the past two months gone from zero subscribers, Ken and Jay and L, to now over 1,000 subscribers, urologists, in the space of two months. Over 6,000 views of the various uh, videos that are in there. So yours is going to be one of the, uh, I, I think, most prominent ones because just the beautiful way in which you shared your experience, your logic, and your um, uh, you know problem-solving skills. So uh, thank you very much again uh, for your friendship, your collegiality, and your leadership in the field. Uh, we are admirers. Thank you for your support of Dr. Lodoyle and Jeff. You did a fantastic job in your case presentation as well. And for those still out there listening, uh, our next week's um, 60 Minutes, this is on May 21st. It's going to be on robotic complications. Uh, it's going to be an interesting talk. And it is actually going to be in the evening from 5 to 6 p.m. So because of everybody returning to work, 5 to 6 p.m. is the time period that will work equally well on the East Coast as well. So again, thank you all. Appreciate it. And thank you, Jeff, for an outstanding job. Thanks, Dr. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thanks, guys.